Hello, and welcome to Rev. Collins Reflections and Wingham United Church once again. This service is being prepared for January 23rd of 2022. Our call to worship today is also our psalm reading. Uh, I'm reading from Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4 and 7 to 10. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. We light our Christ candle, as always, as a visible reminder of Christ's presence among us, and as a prayer for the Lord's enlightenment. The words of our opening prayer will appear on uh, your computer screen, so I invite you to read along with me, pray with me. Let's pray. You call us together, O God, as a community of faith, so that together we may study our scriptures and discern your will. As individuals, we seek your presence in the world around us, in the seemingly ordinary and mundane events of life. As community, we seek your presence in this place and in the care and fellowship that we share, the hymns we sing, the prayers we say together. In private, we listen for the teachings and guidance of your spirit. You know the secret, private thoughts in our minds and prayers in our hearts. As church, we come together to serve you, one another, and the world. Inspired to share our gifts and abundance with those in need as we carry out our mandate to love God and love our neighbor. As the body of Christ, we work together, worship together, and pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn this week is number 313 in Voices United, God Whose Almighty Word.
Well, hello again, and here we are back in Brother Bear's study uh, once again. Before we begin our scripture study for the week, let's ask for the Spirit's um, enlightenment uh, on the, the readings we're about to study, that we might gain better understanding of the true meaning um, for our lives in, that we find in these scripture passages. Let, let's pray. Just as we see your wisdom and glory in nature around us, O God, may we hear your word for us in the words of these readings, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may be drawn closer to you through Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be guided and inspired by you, O Lord, our strength and our hope. Amen. Well, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm <coughs> hair is very dry in here, and I'm having a bit of a tickle in my throat today, so I may have to clear my throat from time to time, <coughs> like that, as we go along. Um, we're going to begin today with uh, a reading from the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah doesn't get a lot of attention in our lectionary, uh, but it is an interesting read. Unlike um, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and others for whom many of the books of the Bible are named, Nehemiah was not a prophet. Uh, he was, uh, he became a governor of Israel, but as the story begins, he's a cupbearer to the king living in exile. Now Israel and Judah had been taken into exile by the Babylonians. Uh, thousands of Jews were taken away to serve as slaves and were treated uh, quite cruelly and, and heavily oppressed. Now under the leadership of King Cyrus, the Persian Empire overthrew the Babylonians in 539 BCE. Uh, now Cyrus was a very different kind of ruler than the Babylonian king Belshazzar uh, and those before him. Uh, and Cyrus set the Jewish people free. Although those who were living in Babylon at this point had never ever seen their homeland, so many of them remained where they were because it was familiar in what they knew. And now years later, after the death of King Cyrus, uh, King Artaxerxes uh, reigns with the same benevolence as Cyrus did. So the Jews were treated much better and lived, um, despite being far from their homeland, lived as free people. Now one day, when it was time for the king's wine to be served, he noticed that his cupbearer appeared quite sad, and he asked why. And now Nehemiah was his cupbearer, and, and Nehemiah revealed his sadness for his homeland, which had not yet been rebuilt after the devastation of the Babylonians uh, long ago. Um, and Artaxerxes agrees to Nehemiah's request to allow him to return to Israel to rebuild his homeland and provides him with all the necessary documentation and, and resources to carry out this mission. So Nehemiah returns to Israel with thousands of his fellow countrymen and the work of rebuilding uh, Israel and particularly Jerusalem begins. Now when the walls of Jerusalem had been restored, the people gathered together to, to celebrate this milestone, and they asked the scribe Ezra to read from the book of the Law of Moses. And this is where we come into the story today. So reading from Nehemiah in chapter 8, um, verses 1 to 3, 5 to 6, and 8 to 10. And I'll mention a little bit later why we kind of skip a couple of verses in there. There, there are big long lists of uh, names that are difficult to pronounce that don't really add a lot to the story. So we just kind of skip over those. So beginning at Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. 
And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, that's the end of, of the reading. Um, now, a few things stand out for me from this story. Uh, first is that when Ezra opened the book, which I imagine means more literally that he unrolled the scroll, uh, all the people stood, a sign of respect and honor. Uh, Ezra, as he does this, is standing on a, a wooden platform uh, that was made specifically for the purpose that got him him up where everybody could see. Our scripture also states that the book of the law of Moses was read with interpretation. Uh, now as I mentioned our reading omits verses 4 and 7 both of which include a rather lengthy list of priests who joined Ezra in the reading and in interpreting what had been read so that all could understand. Not unlike what I attempt to do each week uh, in our worship services. Um, and then, you know, I read scripture, I offer reflection and interpretation. Um, even then, back in thousands of years ago, the priests understood that scripture needed to be interpreted and explained. The people listened attentively and worshipped in the hot mid-eastern sun from early morning until midday. But what really stands out to me is their reaction to the words they heard. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. They'd been living in a foreign land, following the religions and customs of a different culture. And now, when faced with the word of God, their God, they find themselves overcome with guilt and sadness over their own actions and behaviors. Now, there's no message here of reprimand, however, uh, from either Ezra or the priests, or, or a call to repent and atone for their sin, Perhaps there's no need. The, the people's tears are perhaps evidence enough that they've heard the message and taken it to heart. They've not only heard the law of Moses read to them, but they've heard what it had to tell them. And that's a very important part. So the restoration then is not only that, the, uh, that of the city of Jerusalem or the nation of Israel, but it's, it's also a restoration of the people in their relationship with God. So this then is a day of joy and celebration, not grief and weeping. So they're told to go, feast, eat, drink, and be merry. And importantly, to share with those for whom nothing has been prepared. Now, even in this, there's this message of love and justice for neighbors as well as God. Now, we in the Christian church tend to be suspicious of the law. <laughs> We certainly don't celebrate it as Judaism does. Uh, Simchat Torah, which means rejoicing in the Torah, is still an annual celebration uh, and is celebrated with the reading of Torah. Uh, but Christianity frowns upon the law. <laughs> our, our ancient doctrine assures us that salvation is not dependent upon obedience to the law. Christ died for our sins, so we are forgiven and redeemed, right? But the New Covenant doesn't tell us that the law is no longer relevant. In fact, Scripture states repeatedly that with the New Covenant, the law will be written on our hearts, made part of our very being. Uh, in fact, in Matthew chapter 5, and verses 17 and 18, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus states, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, 
Not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The Gospels, upon which Christianity stand, tell us in no uncertain terms that the law is not only still relevant, but vital to our lives with God. In Luke's Gospel, after spending 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus returns to his hometown, and today's Gospel reading tells us of what happened there. Uh, in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of, the, of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That ends this week's gospel lesson. So the good news for the poor is that the law has been fulfilled in Jesus. Justice, compassion, mercy, and love will be the guiding principles of all who follow Jesus. This is the fulfillment of the law. One doesn't erase the other. Just as the law of Moses was read to the people with interpretation at the water gate, so we also must read it with interpretation through the life and teachings of Jesus, who came to ensure its fulfillment. The law is still necessary and will be essential until everyone who calls himself Christian respond to the Spirit of the Lord when it comes upon them, just as Jesus said which will lead them to obey the law, not out of fear of punishment, but out of their desire to see the world become what it was created to be, a world of peace, justice, equality, compassion, and love. It makes me wonder if the tears the Israelites shed on the day the book of the law was read before them were tears of mourning and grief, as the priests seemed to think, or were they perhaps tears of joy upon hearing this good news for the poor? Perhaps it depends on how it was interpreted for them. That, I believe, has a great deal of relevance for us today as it did then. How we interpret scripture tends to divide us into factions and denominations, despite Jesus' own prayer that all who follow him would be united as one body. There are lots of reasons for this, and often the differences are, are more political or cultural than theological. This week just happens to be the International Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. And while the pandemic obviously prevents us from holding any activities to mark the occasion this year, I hope that we can soon return to the practice and in doing so find ways of emphasizing those beliefs we hold in common and set aside the relatively minor differences that keep us apart. This community already has a, a strong grasp of that concept. Since we have the advantage of knowing Christ and learning from him how the law should be interpreted, we should celebrate the law with gladness and joy. For we know that it is the good news that Jesus came to share with the world, the good news for the poor, that our world was designed to function with justice, integrity, compassion, and love. When we can find unity in our dedication to the law, as Christ interprets it for us, then we can seek solidarity with our brothers and sisters in the Judaic and Islamic traditions as well. For we are all children of God, subject to the law, and blessed by God's grace, as it was and as it always shall be. And in this lies our only hope 
for the future of our children and of our world. Let's pray. God of love, divine and all-knowing, you bring us together. Your spirit guides and inspires us. Your grace empowers us. Your word informs us. Each sunrise brings new possibilities, new birth, new life. Your constant presence is a blessing. Your accompaniment on our journey, a gift beyond comprehension. Open our eyes that we may see your presence and majesty in the world around us. Open our ears that our minds might grasp the message you wish to hear, you wish us to hear. Open our hearts that we might reach out with the love of Christ to the world around us. And open our minds that we might hear the message of love the world around us sings. God of love, surround us. Fill us with your grace and love. Show us how we might be your blessing to the world in faith and in action. We offer prayers for our loved ones who experience illness, grief, or loneliness. Where we have the power, lead us to help. Where we cannot, by our own human weakness, change the course of another's life, we pray for your intercession and your Spirit's presence. We pray and hope for peace, contentment, and joy for all of creation. For we know that this is your will. Lead us as we dedicate our lives to helping bring these blessings to the world. We now take these few moments to contemplate in our hearts the changes we wish to see in the world and our part in making them come to pass according to your holy will. Hear us, God of grace. We know you hear our prayers. We know that when we allow it, you answer them. We understand that your way is not always the way we would choose, but we trust in your wisdom and vision for the world you created. We pray these things in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Guide. Amen. Well, our closing hymn today is one that I think just sings out um, the very things that we've been talking about today. It's number 238 in Voices United, How Great Thou Art.
Let us give generously from that which has been given to us, that through our offerings the good news of Jesus Christ may be fulfilled. For the gifts we have received, let's pray. God of life and resurrection, bless these gifts we bring, that they may be expressions of your love in our world. Amen. Well, as you enter the world this week, I remind you once again to remember the words of the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your strength, all your heart, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Seek to be a blessing to everyone you meet. Brighten someone's day every chance you get. And take time to enjoy the beauty of God's creation all around you. And in these you will find the peace and the presence of God. We extinguish the Christ candle now to mark the end of our service of worship, but to begin our service in the world as we carry the light of Christ with us wherever we go. May you see Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the light of Christ in you. May the love of God, the wisdom of Christ, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit lead and inspire you throughout the days ahead. Amen.